بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اغفر لنا ولشيخنا وللحاضرين قال المصنف رحمه الله تعالى والإيمان بالرؤية يوم القيامة كما روي عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من الأحاديث السحاة وأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قد رأى ربه فإنه مأثور عن عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صحيح رواه قتاد عن عكرمة عن ابن عباس ورواه الحكم ابن أبان عن عكرمة عن ابن عباس ورواه علي بن زيد عن يوسف عن يوسف بن مهران عن ابن عباس والحديث عندنا على ظاهره كما جاء عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم والكلام فيه بدعة ولكن نؤمن به كما ولكن نؤمن به كما جاء على ظاهره ولا ولا نناظره ولا نناظر فيه أحدا الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد أو أما بعد البعض من أهل اللغة ينتقد كلمة وبعد فيقول أفضل شيء أن تقول ثم أما بعد أو مباشرة أن تقول أما بعد ذكر المصنف رحمه الله تعالى في هذا المقطع الرؤية وفيه ثلاث مسائل المسألة الأولى ثبوت الرؤية للمؤمنين في الجنة أدلتها ومواقف الناس منها والمسألة الثانية هل يرى الله في القيامة غير المؤمنين هل يراه غير المؤمنين يوم القيامة والمسألة الثالثة هل رأى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ربه Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of Al-Alameen, the worlds, and may the peace and the blessings and the prayers of Allah be upon the Messenger Muhammad, upon his companions, and upon his family in their entirety to proceed. And some of the people, they oppose this matter of saying Wabad straight away, rather they insist upon Amma and then Ba'd. But that's a linguistic point. As for the issue that we now speak about, it is in relation to the ru'ya of Allah, meaning the vision, seeing Allah in the hereafter. And in relation to this point, we have three matters that need to be discussed. The first of them is in relation to the believers seeing Allah in the hereafter, i.e. when Allah Azza wa Jalla has admitted them into Jannah. The second is that will those who are non-Muslims other than the believers see Allah in the hereafter? And the third relates to the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did he see Allah when he was taken up as will be explained? The first question is that the Ahl al-Sunnah and the Jama'ah on the time of the time and the time that the Muslims سوف يرون ربهم يوم القيامة وأنه أفضل نعيم عندهم وقد دل على ذلك الكتاب والسنة والإجماع وخالف في ذلك أربع طوائف من الطوائف الشاذة وهم الجهمية والمعتزلة والخوارج والرافضة in relation to this matter, the seeing of Allah for the believers in the hereafter on the day of judgment, that is a matter in which there is unanimity of opinion. There is a consensus amongst the scholars regarding this matter. Throughout the different times and periods of our history, they have agreed upon this point that the believers will see Allah in the hereafter. And that has not been argued or differed with in relation to this matter except by four groups of deviated uh, individuals or four groups of deviation and, and they are the Jahmiyyah, they are the Mu'tazila, 
the Khawarij and the Rafida. These four groups of deviated individuals, they have opposed this principle, even though what has affirmed it is that which has come from Al Quran, the book, it has come from the Sunnah, it has also come from the narrations that came before. <coughs> أما الأدلة من القرآن فهي كثيرة نقتصر على ثلاثة أو أربعة آيات الآية الأولى هي قول الله سبحانه وتعالى للذين أحسنوا الحسنى وزيادة أجمع المفسرون على أن هذه الزيادة المذكورة في الآية للذين أحسنوا الحسنى الجنة والزيادة رؤية المؤمنين ربهم في الجنة وقد فسر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هذه الزيادة بقوله من حديث صهيب الرومي رضي الله عنه قال كما جاء في صحيح مسلم قال إن الله عز وجل ينادي أهل الجنة يا أهل الجنة يا أهل الجنة إن لكم موعدا سوف ننجزكم إياه أن يقول لكم عندنا موعد آخر غير الجنة فيقولون يا ربنا ألم تبيض وجوهنا ألم تدخلنا الجنة ألم تزحزحنا عن النار قال بلى إن لكم موعدا فيكشف الحجاب فيرونه فينظرون إليه سبحانه وتعالى نظرا حقيقيا ويرون أن هذا أعظم نعيم عندهم حتى إنهم بعد أن يعودوا إلى أزواجهم من الحور العين يقولون لقد زدتم جمالا فلألأت وجوهكم أكثر فما الذي حصل وذلك بسبب التمتع بالنظر إلى وجه الله الكريم نسأل الله أن يمتعني وإياكم as for the evidences that affirm that Allah will be seen in the hereafter with regards to the believers, then they are numerous. But we will suffice ourselves with the ones that shall follow. The first of them is the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَ which means that indeed those who perform righteous actions for them is Al-Husna, which refers to Al-Jannah and al ziyada And that this term al ziyada was further explained in the hadith of Suhaib Arumi, in which he said that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that when the believers are admitted into paradise, a caller will call out, O people, or inhabitants of paradise, or inhabitants of paradise. And then Allah will address them, i.e. the inhabitants, and say that, O people of paradise, indeed there is a promise that we will fulfill for you now. And the believers will respond and say, O our Lord, did you not brighten our faces and place us in Jannah? Did you not admit us into paradise? Did you not remove us? from the tribulations of the fire. So what can follow after this? And Allah Azza wa Jalla will say, rather, there is another, an additional matter that needs to be fulfilled. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla will remove the veil that covers his face. So the radiance and the glorification of your Lord will become apparent to the believers and they will look at Allah in reality, in truth, looking towards them. When those believers then return back to their family, their beauty, the radiance that they have upon their faces, that will be further increased to the point that they will be addressed by their families and they will be told that indeed you have returned to us and you look more radiant, you look more pleasant in appearance than before you left us. And the reason for that increase in their radiance and beautification is that they looked at the face of their Lord. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla that He should.
delight us collectively by looking and gazing at his face in the hereafter. Al-Ayat al-Thaniya, Qawlu Allah Azza wa Jal, Wujuhun yawma'idhin nadirah ila rabbiha nadirah. وقد ذكر غير واحد من المفسرين أن المقصود بقوله تعالى إلى ربها ناظرة تنظر إلى وجه الله الكريم يعني أهل الجنة. The second ayah in which we affirm this principle is the one in which Allah mentions وجوه يوم إذ ناظرة إلى ربها ناظرة that on that day faces will be radiant, nadira, ila rabbiha, towards their Lord they will be looking. Now, many from amongst <coughs> al-mufassirun, those who came before who interpreted this, explained that the ila, na, ila rabbiha nadira, it means that they will be looking at the face of their Lord. That is the understanding that we have from this ayah. من ال ووجه الدلالة من هاتين الآيتين من ثلاثة وجوه. And the evidences which are indicative that this is an affirmation of this principle are of three types. الوجه الأول قوله إلى ربها ناظرة وقد عديت بإلى عديت عدي النظر بإلى ونظر إذا عديت بإلى فيقصد بها النظر بالعين وإذا عديت بفي فالمقصود التفكر والاعتبار وإذا عديت بنفسها بدون حرف جر فالمقصود الإمهال والانتظار كما يقول المنافقون يوم القيامة للمؤمنين انظرونا نقتبس من نوركم the point to note regarding how we understand the benefit from this ayah is that when Allah said nadira, that on that day faces will be radiant ila rabbiha nadira, looking ila towards their Lord. The point to note here is that we have ila. This is a preposition in Arabic harfu jar and that is following the uh, term nadira or it is related to nadira it precedes it but it is what we say connected to it now when we have this term nadira which is connected to this preposition ila then it means that it is a sight it refers to looking at something and the uh, area of the face here, which is mentioned that will do the looking, is the eyes. So whenever we have this verb, nadhara, meaning he looked, and it is made transitive with a preposition, ila, then it gives rise, or it means, looking at, i.e. with eyes. However, nadhara itself, it can be made transitive with fi. Now, when it's made transitive with fi, then it relates to something else. It relates to a tafakkur, thinking and reflecting. So it has a different meaning. And third and finally, nadhara can be alone, i.e. without any preposition that it relates to. And when that happens, the meaning of it is asking for a delay or respite. And the proof of that is the ayah in which the munafiqun will say, Addressing the believers, they will say on Yom Al Qiyamah, addressing the believers that give us respite or wait or delay in order that we can also take from your light that they will be furnished with on Yom Al Qiyamah. So we have three understandings of how that term nadhara can be used dependent upon whether this harfujar, this preposition, is attached to it and if it is. إلا في أو في absent from it. الوجه الثاني أنه قد عبر بالوجوه التي مهل محل العينين والعينان محل النظر حيث قال تعالى وجوه يومئذ ناضرة 
أي فرحة مسرورة وحسنة ثم قال إلى ربها ناظرة من المعلوم أن الوجه هو محل العينين فقوله وجوه يومئذ ناظرة مبتهجة حسنة إلى ربها ناظرة تنظر بالعينين التي في الوجه The second point by which we can understand this is an evidence for this principle is that this ayah it comprises of a particular type of expression and that is the mentioning of the face. The very fact that the face is mentioned is indicative of the principle that the organ that will be doing the looking or the seeing is the face. And what we know that on the face are eyes. Eyes are the organs by which sight is, is uh, actualized. Therefore, because the face is mentioned, and that is where a person can see something else by virtue of the eyes, we know that this is a real looking. And Allah mentioned that on that day, faces will be nadira. So they will be delighted and rejoicing, and they will be radiant and luminous. They will be bright and cheerful. That is because they will be looking with their eyes towards their Lord. الوجه الثالث أنه لا توجد قرينة تصرف النظر عن معناه الحقيقي الذي هو ظاهر النص إلى أي معنى آخر. يعني لا توجد قرينة تصرفه عن النظر بالعين إلى الله عز وجل إلى أي وجه آخر. The third point, which is indicative of this principle in its affirmation, is that there is nothing present within this ayah which gives rise or which by which we can infer that this looking is anything other than sight actualized by the eyes. So there is nothing present in this ayah, as we mentioned previously, that if it was absent, or if there was no preposition that made it transitive, or something other article that was acting upon it, that therefore removed the reality of the looking. And in its absence, we therefore infer that this is a real looking via the eyesight. Al-ayat al-thalitha qawluhu ta'ala wa ladayna mazid wa qad nassa mufassirun ala anna al-mazid huwa al-nazaru ila wajhi Allah al-kareem. And the third ayah is where Allah said wa ladayna mazid and with us is a mazid. And that mazid was explained by the commentators al-mufassirun that it refers to the ru'ya of Allah, the vision of Allah. Al-ayat al-rabi'a qawlu Allah azza wa jal kalla innahum an rabbihim yawmaidhin lamahjubun qala al-imam al-shafi'i bima anna al-kuffara yuhjabun an al-nazari ila wajhi Allah al-kareem fal-ayat dalilun ala anna al-mu'minina yanzurun ila rabbihim yawma al-qiyama The fourth ayah which indicates this principle is the one in which Allah mentions that no rather on that day they will be veiled from their Lord meaning that they will not be looking at Allah and Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah mentions that if now the mujrimun, the criminals will be veiled from looking at Allah, they will be prohibited from that by virtue of Allah being displeased with them. So they're being veiled in a situation because of Allah's displeasure towards them. It must mean, therefore, that those individuals with whom Allah is pleased, that they will then have the honor of looking at Him. As for the ahadith, the narrations, then they are mutawatira, meaning they've been transmitted by multiple chains. So we have numerous chains of narration in which the narrators have transmitted this narration. Therefore, they are authentic and they affirm this principle. Min hadhi al ahadith, hadith Jarir ibn Abdullah, qal, innakum satarawn rabbakum. كما ترون القمر ليلة البدر 
لا تضامون في رؤيته أي لا تحجبون عنه وفي رواية لا تضامون في رؤيته أي لا تتزاحمون كما أنكم لا تتزاحمون عند النظر إلى القمر أو الشمس في رابعة النهار فكذلك أنتم المؤمنون تنظرون إلى ربكم دون مضارة أو مزاحمة وفي رواية لا تضارون في رؤيته أي لا يضركم أحد ولا يحول بينكم وبينه ثم قال صلى الله عليه وسلم فإن استطعتم أن لا تغلبوا على صلاة قبل طلوع الشمس وصلاة قبل غروبها فافعلوا والمقصود هنا صلاة العصر وصلاة صلاة الفجر وصلاة العصر صلاة الفجر وصلاة العصر يعني احرصوا ألا يسبقكم أحد على صلاة العصر وصلاة الفجر فإنها من أسباب النظر إلى وجه الله الكريم And these narrations that have been transmitted to us, there are over 30 companions that narrated them. And from them is the narration of Jarir ibn Abdullah, radiyallahu anh, who mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that indeed, innakum tarawna rabbakum, that indeed you will see your Lord just as you see the moon on a clear night and nothing shall impede your vision of looking at Allah. And in another narration, it is mentioned that there will be no difficulty in seeing Allah. And there are other narrations that explain that there will be no veil, there will be no impediment preventing you from looking at Allah on that day. So the believers will see their Lord as affirmed by this narration, which is the reason why this great blessing, this virtue, we were exhorted to hasten towards it by performing certain actions amongst them as is mentioned in the narration where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if you are able and if you are able to hasten towards the prayer before the sun rises and before the sun sets then do that and the two prayers that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam is making reference to the first of them before the sun rises is Salatul Fajr, and the one before the sun sets is Salatul Asr. So the believer should hasten in order to perform these prayers, for indeed in its performance is a means for you to be admitted into Jannah and then to have the blessing of looking at the face of your Lord. Well, ليس تشبيها للمرئي بالمرئي حاشاه ذلك وإنما المقصود تشبيه الرؤية بالرؤية فكما أن الرؤية ثابتة لكم عندما ترون القمر أو الشمس فإنك ولا تشكون فيها كذلك رؤية المؤمنين في الآخرة في الجنة لا يشك فيها And it's important to note that when he sallallahu alayhi wasallam made reference to this matter, looking at the moon, that with the ease and with the simplicity and without any difficulty by which you can gaze and view the moon, then that is how you will gaze and view Allah Azza wa Jalla. Then the point to note here is that there is no tishvi, there's no exemplification between what is being seen I, between the moon and between Allah. For Allah is free and far removed from this type of exemplification. Rather, the comparison is not in the, ob of the thing that is being seen, but the, ra rather the manner in which it's going to be seen. So just as we can view the moon on a clear night without any difficulty, then similarly you will view Allah in the hereafter with the same level of ease and facility. من الأحاديث الدالة على ذلك قول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في الدعاء الذي علمه عمار بن ياسر رضي الله عنهما عندما في نقول وهو الذي نقوله في آخر التشهد والحديث طويل ربما أذكره لكم في آخر الدرس 
لكن الشاهد منه قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأسألك اللهم لذة النظر إلى وجهك والشوق إلى لقائك لا أسألك لذة النظر إلى وجهك والشوق إلى لقائك وهو حديث صحيح طويل يقال بعد التشهد لعلي أذكره لكم في آخر الدرس إن شاء الله And similarly from the narrations that affirm this principle is the hadith that contains the supplication that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he taught his companion Ammar ibn Yasir radiyallahu an where he instructed him and this is a lengthy narration or the supplication contained therein is lengthy and perhaps I will mention it in greater detail in our final lesson however sufficient to say is that the point to note from the supplication is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned after the completion of the tashahhud in the prayer that oh i allah i ask for the delight that i will experience by looking at you and for the enthusiasm that i have for meeting with you in the hereafter so these words that are mentioned in the supplication he sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught his companion amar to say this which is indicative of the principle that indeed we will see allah in the hereafter wa mas'alat istid alladhina ankaru ar-ru'ya la nastati' an نتكلم عن جميع شبهاتهم لكن سنذكر شبهة واحدة فقط ونرد عليها. And in relation to those people who deny this principle, i.e. that we will see Allah in the hereafter, then it's not possible to rebut every doubt that they introduce regarding this. But we will suffice ourselves with mentioning one objection that they had and its rebuttal. المعتزلة ومن نهج نهجهم يستدلون بآيتين زورا وعدوانا وظلما وبهتانا وذلك no. The Mu'tazila they use as a means of an evidence to affirm their falsehood wrongfully unlawfully and by way of fabrication two ayat two ayat from Al-Quran to affirm their falsehood الأولى استدلالهم بقول الله عز وجل لموسى لن تراني لن تراني وذلك من وجهين الوجه الأول قالوا إنه نفى بلن ولن تفيد التأبيد نفى بماذا بلن وحرف لن يفيد التأبيد والوجه الثاني أنه علق إمكان الرؤية بثبوت الجبل والجبل لم يثبت بل إنه إنهار والآية الثانية وسنرد على هذتين أو هذه الشبهة نعم Therefore the first point to note is that those who opposed the رؤية of Allah in the hereafter they used Two ayat. The first of them is the one concerning Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. When he asked his Lord, My Lord, show yourself to me that I may look at you. Allah, he responded and said, Lan tarani. You will not see me, but look, undur al jabal. Look at the mountain. And if it stays in its place, then you will see me. Now, the point to note here is that lan is used, this harf, this letter is used. And that letter, they claim, is used in order to refer to something which is absolute. So when Allah said lan tarani, it means you will not see me absolutely. That's a means of negation in the future. Lan preceding a verb in the present tense is indicative of negating in the future. They argued that it is an absolute negation and one that is perpetual. That's the first point to note. The second is they linked 
the possibility of seeing Allah in the hereafter with the mountain staying in its position whole without any kind of deterioration. But it is known that the mountain itself, it crumbled into dust. So similarly, they argued that because it, the mountain, was not able to maintain its structure, then similarly, Allah would not be seen either. وهذا الاستدلال غير صحيح بل هو باطل أولا أن حرفا لا يفيد التأبيد في جميع الأحوال قبل قد يفيد التأبيد أحيانا وقد لا يفيد التأبيد At the point to note here first is that the use of this term لن it does not imply or infer or is indicative of an absolute negation in every situation. Rather, it may imply an absolute negation in certain situations, however, in others it does not. It is dependent upon its context. بل إننا قد وجدنا آيات دلت على أنه لم يفيد التأبيد أعني حرفلا مع كونه قد ذكر فيه لفظ التأبيد. مع كونه قد ذكر فيه لفظ التأبيد انظر إلى قول الله سبحانه وتعالى عن بني إسرائيل ولن يتمنوه أبدا فهذا حرف لن وقد قرن بالتأبيد فقال ولن يتمنوه ماذا أبدا لكن هل أفاد التأبيد هنا لم يفد التأبيد لماذا لماذا لم يفد التأبيد لأنه لأن هناك آية أخرى يتمن يتمنون فيها ماذا؟ يتمنون فيها الموت مع أنه قد نفي سابقا أنهم لن يتمنوا الموت ولكن يوم القيامة يتمنون الموت ما هي الآية؟ ونادوا يا مالك ليقض علينا ربك قال إنكم ماكثون فهنا تمنوا الموت أم لم يتمنوا هنا تمنوا الموت يعني هم تمنوا الموت هنا مع أنهم سبق أن قالوا قال الله عنهم ولن يتمنوه أبدا يعني الله عز وجل ذكر عنهم أنهم لا يمكن أن يتمنوا الموت وقرن ذلك بلفظ التأبيد ثم نجدهم يوم القيامة يتمنون الموت ونادوا يا مالك ليقضي علينا ربك Therefore, as we mentioned, the use of the term lan to negate a verb in the present tense, it is dependent upon its context. In certain situations, it is an absolute negation, and in others, it is not. So we will mention an example of an ayah where that term is used, rather, not only is the term used, but it is also followed by abadan, which is an a further affirmation of something which is absolute. And that is the ayah in with reference to the Israelites, Banu Israel, where Allah Azza wa Jalla mentioned, وَلَنْ يَتَمَنَّوْهُ أَبَدًا that indeed they will never wish for that matter, i.e. death. But they are the ones who said that we are the chosen ones. But when it, when they were questioned, therefore, that seek death, Allah mentions that they will never seek this matter. So two terms are important here. One is their use of, or Allah's use of lan, which is mentioned preceding yatamanno, I wishing. And the second is that it is followed or succeeded by abada, meaning absolutely. Therefore, in summary, that ayah represents how Banu Israel will never seek death. However, does it mean, therefore, that it is eternal and absolute? Because that's the point to note here. Does the use of lun, even though it's now superseded or it's followed by Abaddon, actually indicate an eternal and absolute negation? The answer is no. Why? Because we have another ayah in which Allah mentions that actually the unbelievers will seek that death comes upon them. They will seek that it's hastened 
and that is in the ayah وَنَادَوْ يَا مَالِكْ لِيَقْضِيَ لَيْنَا رَبُّكْ They will say, O Malik, the gatekeeper of the fire, and let your Lord call upon your Lord and let him hasten our death. And they will be told that, no, rather you're going to stay here. So, because amongst the unbelievers they will ask this, then the Israelites fall into this category. So even though in the previous ayah, Allah mentions that they will never seek death, using the term lan, and then following it with abada. In the second ayah, we have an example or a context where in reality they will seek this, which is indicative of this principle, that lan, even though it's now coupled with abada, does not mean it's an absolute negation. لما جاز تحديده بغاية معينة يعني لم يجوز تحديده إلى غاية معينة وقد جاء في القرآن ما يدل على تحديده بغاية معينة كما قال الله تبارك وتعالى عن أحد إخوة يوسف لن أبرح الأرض حتى يأذن لي أبي أو يحكم الله لي وهو خير الحاكمين انظر قيد لن بأحد أمرين وقال لن أبرح الأرض يعني لن أمشي من هذه الأرض سأظل أهيم على وجهي في هذه الأرض حتى تحقيق أو حتى تحقيق غايتين إما أن يأذن لي أبي أو يحكم الله لي وهو خير الحاكمين فهنا قيدت بي بي بالتحديد غاية معينة فدل على أنها لا تفيد التأبيد إلا بحسب ما يقتضيه السياق Thereafter, the next point to note regarding this is that where we have this term being used alone but it is made specific for a particular objective or a particular purpose then in that instance clearly it is not an absolute and eternal negation where this term is used but it is coupled or connected with a particular purpose, which once fulfilled, then it removes or that absolute nature of the negation is suspended, then clearly in that instance, it's not applicable. So we have an example of that with regards to what happened with the brothers of Yusuf, alayhi salam, where the older one amongst them, after the incident occurred, and it's lengthy in its detail, but the point to note is the elder one of the brothers, he said, Len al -ard, that I will never leave this land that I'm in, which was um, Egypt at the time, that I'm not going to leave this place until hatta ya'dhan li abi. That I'm not going to leave this place. And then he mentioned two conditions or two situations where if they took place, then he would leave. And the first of them is until Allah ruled in that matter. And the second is when their father would give them permission or him permission in order to return or exit from that land. So in this ayah, we have an example of the use of lan to indicate that something is not going to happen, in this case, departing from that land or that area. However, because it is coupled with two conditions, which if either one of them was fulfilled, then it would negate the absolute intent of lan. We have an evidence which is indicative that lan itself cannot be used to infer something which is an absolute negation because it is dependent upon the context. الأمر الثالث أنه لا يليق بنبي الله موسى عليه السلام أن يطلب أمرا مستحيلا بل لم يطلب إلا أمرا ممكن الوقوع. The next point to note is it's inconceivable that Musa عليه الصلاة والسلام would seek a matter from Allah which in itself was impossible to achieve. والأمر الرابع أن الله عز وجل لم يعاتب موسى على هذا الطلب مما يدل على أنه أمر ممكن 
لكنه عاتب نوحا عليه السلام عندما طلب نجاة ابنه فقال له يا نوح إنه ليس من أهلك إنه عمل غير صالح The fourth matter to note is that Musa عليه السلام was not reprimanded for him seeking to view Allah and that is important that when he asked to see Allah, as we mentioned in the previous ayah, he was not reprimanded for that request. Whereas when Nuh alayhi salam, he asked Allah for or on behalf of his son, who had not accompanied them upon the ark, Allah responded and said, Ya Nuh, O Nuh, innahu laysa min ahlik, that indeed he is not from your family, that his actions are not righteous. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, he responded to Nuh and he told him that your request is not correct because this individual is not in reality from your family by virtue of his evil actions. الأمر الخامس والأخير وإلا في الوجوه كثيرة لكن سنقتصر على هذا أن الله سبحانه وتعالى علق إمكان رؤية موسى لله بإمكان تحمل الجبل لتجلي رب العزة والجلال لماذا؟ لأن الجبل قوي وموسى مخلوق ضعيف فكأن الله عز وجل يقول, يقول له أنت وأنت بهذا الشكل لن تستطيع تحمل رؤيتي ولكن عليك أن تنظر إلى الجبل فإن استقر الجبل, الجبل مكانه فسوف تراني ومعلوم أن الله أن الجبل قد اندك وتفتت وتهشم فلم يتحمل تجلي الرب سبحانه وتعالى فكيف بموسى وهو ذلك البشر المخلوق الضعيف غير أن الله يعطي المؤمنين يوم القيامة من القوة ما يتحملون به هذه الرؤية The fifth matter and we will suffice ourselves with these even though there are many other points that we could make, is that Allah, he connected the possibility of Musa alayhi salam viewing Allah to the possibility of the mountain viewing Allah. So he connected Musa's ability alayhi salam to view Allah in this world to how when Allah exposed a small part of his majesty to the mountain whether or not that would endure that vision now it's important to note that the connection here is between a human being who is inherently weak in structure and stature to a mountain which is inherently sturdy and firm in its stature just as when Allah he revealed himself to the mountain what happened Allah said that if it is able to remain in its position, in its frame, then you will see me. However, when Allah did reveal himself to the mountain, it was rendered into dust. It was destroyed in totality. It was obliterated, was this mountain, this firm, sturdy structure. So it wouldn't have been possible, therefore, for Musa in his state to have tolerated or endured looking at Allah Azza wa Jalla. But the point to note here is that that was in the life of this world, that Allah, he revealed himself to this mountain. That is something else as opposed to what will occur in the hereafter. والمسألة الثانية هل يرى كل الناس الله تبارك وتعالى يوم القيامة ثلاثة أقوال القول الأول أنه لا يراه إلا المؤمنون فقط وهم يرونه مرتين مرة في عرصات القيامة والمرات الأخرى في الجنة وهي غير محدودة رؤياهم في الجنة غير محدودة والمرة الأولى في عرصات القيامة قبل, قبل عبور الصراط وقبل الميزان والقول الثاني أنه يراه كل الناس ثم بعد ذلك لا يراه إلا المؤمنون والقول الثالث 
أنه يراه المنافقون والمؤمنون فقط ثم يحتجب عن المنافقين وتبقى الرؤية خاصة بمن؟ بالمؤمنين أرجحها القول الثالث وإن كان القول الثاني فيه قوة أن المنافقين قد يرون لكنهم يرون رؤية حرمان وازدراء فلا يتمتعون بالرؤية كما يتمتع من المؤمنون Thereafter, the next point, the second matter in this is the issue of will all of mankind view Allah in the hereafter? And in relation to this, there are three opinions. The first of them is that only the believers will see Allah in the hereafter. And that will be in two places. The first of them is on the plains of Yawm al Qiyamah. So on that occasion, in the hereafter, on the Day of Judgment, and it will take place prior or before the passage across the bridge. That is the first place in which the believers will see Allah in the hereafter. The second is in Jannah itself, but that uh, place or that time has not been specified. The second opinion is that all of mankind will see Allah in the hereafter, and then it will only be the believers who will see him thereafter. So initially it will be all of mankind, then only the believers. And the third opinion states that it will be the believers and al-munafiqun, the hypocrites, who will see Allah. However, the believers will then continue to see Allah in the hereafter in paradise, and the Munafikun, they will be veiled from Allah. And it is mentioned that even if they see Allah, it will not be one in which they will derive happiness or pleasure. Rather, it will be one in which they experience sorrow and regret for what they were upon. المسألة الثالثة والأخيرة هل رأى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ربه؟ الإمام أحمد في هذا الكتاب قرر أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى ربه وحذر من التكذيب بذلك وبين أنه وردت فيه أحاديث ولكنه لم يحدد هذه الرؤية هل كانت بالعينين بعيني الرأس أم كانت بالقلب والفؤاد يعني في هذا الحديث رواه مطلقا وفي هذا القول يعني يقول يرون ربهم المؤمنون النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى ربه وحذر من التكذيب بذلك وقال الواجب هو التصديق لأنه قد جاء به الخبر فيجب التصديق وهنا لم يحدد ما إذا كانت الرؤية بالعينين أم بالقلب والفؤاد The third matter is the issue of whether or not the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he saw his Lord and this is an issue in which the author, Al-Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, is of the opinion that yes, he did see Allah by virtue of the fact that we have narrations, authentic, that state that. And it's not correct or permissible for us then to attribute falsehood or fabrication to something which has been authentically narrated. Rather, it is an obligation upon us, as we know, to affirm the truthfulness of that. However, the point to note is what has not been mentioned is the type of viewing, the, the specific type of viewing. The wording of the narration mentions a viewing or looking which is general. However, it's not specified whether this was a view, a vision that was actualized by virtue of the eyesight or a vision that was actualized by virtue of the heart. Because both are possible, and that has not been clarified here. روى بعض تلاميذه أنه نص على العينين على الرؤية بالعينين ولكنها رواية ضعيفة. Some of his students have narrated that what was intended by that is a vision that was actualized by the eyesight. However, those are narrations which are considered to be weak. Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما يبين أنه رآه بفؤاده 
رآه بفؤاده ولم يراه بعينيه. And the companion Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه he said that what had taken place is a vision with his heart. So the man in which the messenger had seen Allah was via his heart. عائشة رضي الله عنها نفت الرؤية الرؤية بالعينين فقالت رضي الله عنها لمسروق قالت ثلاث من ادعاهن فقد أعظم على الله الفرية يعني فقد كذب ثلاثة أمور من ادعاها فقد كذب كذب الأولى من زعم أن الله أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى ربه تقتل بعينيه فقد كذب والثانية من زعم أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يعلم ما في غد يعني يعلم الغيب المطلق فقد كذب والثالثة من زعم أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كتم شيئا مما أوحى الله به إليه فقد كذب أسفى عائشة رضي الله عنها she was of the opinion that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he did not see his Lord rather she mentions as was narrated to Masruq the following she said that indeed the one who alleges to Allah three matters then that is a great and severe fabrication. The first of them is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he saw Allah by his eyes. That is the first. The second is the one who claims that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he had a knowledge of what will take place tomorrow. I that he had knowledge of the unseen in an unrestricted manner. The third of which is, is that the one who claims or alleges that the Prophet وسلم, he concealed matters to himself, i.e. never disclosed them from that which was revealed unto him by revelation. Whoever claims this has fabricated a tremendous lie. وقد سأل أبو ذر كما جاء في الحديث الصحيح سأل أبو ذر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال هل رأيت ربك يا رسول الله فقال لا نورا أن أراه نورا أن أراه وأن أراه على الروايتين وفي رواية قال رأيت نورا لم يره بل رأى, رأى نورا Similarly, we have the narration of Abu Dhar where he questioned the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him, O Messenger of Allah, did you see Allah? And his response was, was nuran anna ara, that rather it was light, that is what I saw. And in another version or narration it is mentioned, it is light what I saw. فتحصل عندنا ثلاث روايات. الرواية الأولى روايات ابن عباس مرة أطلق وقال إنه رآه ومرة قيد الرؤية بالفؤاد رآه بفؤاده ويثابتة أثبت من الأولى والرواية الثانية رواية عائشة وهي نفي الرؤية بالكلية أن النبي لم يرى ربه أبدا في الدنيا والرواية الثالثة حديث أبي ذر أن أنه سأل النبي فنفى أن يكون قد رأى كيف نرجح بين هذه الروايات؟ So in relation to this therefore we have three narrations The first of them is from Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه and we have two narrations from him One of them is unrestricted It is what we call mutlaq meaning he said that he صلى الله عليه وسلم he saw Allah, but never specified how. Then in the second narration, and it is more authentic than the first, he stated that yes, he saw Allah with his heart. The second narration we have of Aisha, عنه, she negated 
that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw Allah. The third of which we have is Abu Dhar, as we mentioned, where looking at Allah is mentioned, but it is only light that was seen. So how do we establish a preference between these three narrations? Well, جمع بين هذه الروايات أن نحمل الروايات التي تنفي الرؤية كقول عائشة وقول أبي ذر على نفي الرؤية بالعين على نفي الرؤية بالعين ونحمل إثبات ابن عباس للرؤية على إثبات الرؤية بالفؤاد لا سيما أن ذلك تأكد منه أكثر من مرة رآه بفؤاده ولكن ثبت أيضا في المسند أنه رآه في المنام ورؤيا النبيين حق لا يتطرق إليه الاحتمال فهو قد رآه في المنام فالرؤية في المنام غير مستحيلة قال رأيت ربي في المنام فسألني فيما يختصم الملأ الأعلى تفسيرا لقول الله تعالى في سورة صاد لا قبل في الملأ الأعلى إذ يختصمون إن يوحى إلي إلا أنما أنا رسول مبين إلا نذير نذير مبين ما كان لي ما كان لي بمحسنته ما كان لي من من علم بالملأ الأعلى إذ يختصمون وفي هذا رسالة لابن رجب بمفهوم الجواب الأولى فيما يختصم فيه الملأ الأعلى فارجعوا إليه نعم. So how therefore do we affect a reconciliation between these apparently different narrations? The manner in which we do this أنا is... نختب بهذا وتكمل الترجمة يكون ختام درسنا الليلة في مسألة الرؤية لأنها طويلة وأطلنا عليكم فيها فقنا الله وإياكم لكم so how therefore do we affect a reconciliation between these different narrations apparently the way that we do this is we say that the narration of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari adaf Aisha radiyallahu anha is that this is a negation of the vision of Allah with the eyes that the Prophet وسلم, did not see Allah with his eyesight. As for the narration of Ibn Abbas, then what we affirm from this is that yes, the Prophet وسلم, he did see Allah with his fu'ad, with his heart. That is the manner in which we affect a reconciliation between these different narrations. However, we also have another narration in the Musnad of Al Imam Ahmed where it is mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, he did see his Lord in a dream. So during the course of a dream, he saw his Lord. And as we know that the dreams of the Prophets are true, it's not correct, it's not allowed that we should differ or contradict what has been mentioned with regards to prophets and their dreams. So we accept that, particularly as the Prophet ﷺ said, that indeed I saw my Lord and I was informed or I asked about the matter of al malal A'la, the ones, the occupants of the higher heavens and their dispute. So that issue that the Prophet ﷺ is making reference to is what has been mentioned in Surah Sad, where a dispute occurred by some of the occupants of the high heavens, and that was, that is in relation to the creation of Adam ﷺ, although this wasn't mentioned by the Sheikh, but it's in reference to the creation of Adam and how the angels disputed 
between themselves regarding that matter. So that is what was mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ during the course of the dream that he, in which he saw his Lord. And on this point, we shall conclude because the subject of the Ru'i of Allah is lengthy and it's become late now. So we shall conclude on that point. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu